Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Clinical Validation of the Alinity MHR HPV Assay. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Abbott Global Scientific Affairs. To learn more, visit molecular.abbott.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now present today's speaker, Anya Osterbank, Analyst in Laboratory Biomedicine, Institute of Microbiology and Immunology, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Anya, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Hello, my name is Anja osterwing Valenczak, and I will present today clinical validation of the Alinity M high-risk HPV assay. So this is my disclosure slide. And I would like to start with the status of HPV tests that are on the global market in 2020. So our research group has been performing the inventory of HPV assays since 2010. And as you can see, in the last decade, the number of HPV assays available on, on the global market has been increasing dramatically. So in our first inventory in 2010, we have identified 70 HPV assays. And this year, we have identified almost uh, more than uh, 250 HPV tests. So what is the problem? The problem is that we have shown that more, almost 60% of the HPV tests, uh, tests that are currently present are without any single peer-reviewed publication. Even higher percentage, more than 80% of HPV tests are without published analytical and or clinical evaluation in the peer-reviewed uh, literature. Um, and the most concerning thing is that over 90% of the HPV tests is not evaluated according to the standards that are agreed in HPV community. So we urge to the HPV test manufacturers to perform the evaluation of HPV tests that are daily used in clinical practices. So at the moment, we still have the guidelines from 2009 from Myers Group, and uh, these are the guidelines for the HPV tests that are used in clinical practice. And basically, there are three, three items in these guidelines that must be met so HPV assays can be safely used in the primary HPV screening. So the first one is about clinical sensitivity for CN2+. The second is clinical specificity that should be non-inferior to the standard comparator, which can be either hybrid CAPTCHA-2 or GP5 plus 6 plus. And the last one is about the performance and robustness of HPV tests and it's regarding the intralaboratory reproducibility and interlaboratory agreement. So the study that I'm going to present in the first part of my talk is about Slovenian HPV prevalence study. So the first screening round was performed in 2009 to 2010, and it was performed in Slovenia. So Slovenia is relatively small European country. We have about 2 million of 
uh, people living in Slovenia. And as you can see, we are right in the middle of the Europe. And in we have uh, quite effective nationally organized cervical cancer screening program with high coverage, over 70%. And in addition to that, we also have HPV vaccination that is integrated into national immunization program. It's free of charge, it's school-based, uh, but unfortunately, eh, we have relatively low appliance. We have about 45 to 55 coverage, and we are hoping that this will rise. So the gynecologists that were included in our study are from all over the country and we have in, enrolled 4,400 women that were aged 20 to 64 and who were attending their routine pap screening. So the sample is representative for our uh, population and we have collected the cervical samples into tin prep medium and they were uh, Aliquoted and stored at minus 80 upon arrival in the laboratory. So, besides the samples for HPV testing, we have also performed conventional cytology. This is standard of care in Slovenia. And also, the colposcopy and biopsy was performed according to standard of care in Slovenia, which is ASCUS high or worse cytology. However, Irrespective of the cytology result, all women that were HPV 16 or HPV 18 positive were also invited to the colposcopy. So entire cohort was tested with four different HPV assays. Uh, the first one was hybrid capture 2 from Kyogen. Uh, the second one was real time from Abbott and also the new alinity that we are discussing today. And the last one was Cobas from Roche and we have used the 4,800 platform. So the second screening round of our study was performed three years later and it lasted from 2012 and till 2014. And in this second screening round, we were able to enroll 3,800 women. And this cohort was tested using real-time and alinity alone. So this is a study timeline that shows the identification of the CN2 plus cases. I will just quickly go through it. So in the first screening round, we have identified 68 CN2 plus cases. And in the second screening round, we have identified 36 CN2 plus cases. So a little more than 100 of CN2 plus cases were identified in both screening rounds. And the study is still ongoing. We are following women through national data registry, and we are collecting data about cytology and uh, histology result. So I will start with the prevalence um, that was assessed using alinity in the first screening round. So as we can see and as we, can, as we expected, the highest burden of HPV prevalence was among the youngest in the highest in the age group 20 to 24 and also 25 to 29. But what we also, uh, but we can also see from this uh, graph, we can see that when, uh, we hope this is going to be soon, when Slovenia switched to HPV primary screening, hopefully in the next uh, next years, we, uh, we will probably start HPV primary screening from age 35 because the prevalence is just too high in, in, in the women that are younger than that. Also, if we uh, plot on the same graph the prevalence from the second screening round, shown here in orange, we can see that the prevalence is basically the same through the age groups, and there are no statistical significant differences 
between the prevalence in the first and the second screening round. We have also done the sub-analysis for the prevalence according to the cytology result. So we have taken women that had normal cytology and then the, the rest were ASCUS group, LCL group and HICIL group. And we can see very clearly that the prevalence for HPV infection is corresponding to the cytology severity. So the, the, the more severe cytology is, the higher, the higher the prevalence is. So the highest prevalence were, was in high seal, almost 85%. I would like to show you also the prevalence uh, according to cytology for all of the five channels of alinity. So alinity assay is, um, has the potential for expanded genotyping. And we can identify HPV-16, HPV-18, and HPV-45 separately. And then we have two channels, channel A and channel B. In channel A, we have HPV types 31, 33, 52, and 58. In the channel B, uh, the other seven HPV types are included. And what is interesting here is that in all the other groups, the HPV prevalence is rising is, and it's corresponding to cytology severity, except in, except in the last group, so channel B of alinity, where we can see that the prevalence for HPV infection of uh, channel B is declined significantly in the group of women that had high seal cytology. So this was the first clue for the HPV triage, but we're going to uh, talk a bit more in, in risk in the next part of my talk. So I will start with the um, evaluation of identity according to Meyer guidelines that I mentioned before. So we have compared the performance of identity with hybrid capture 2, which is considered as gold standard. And the sensitivity was assessed on 68 CN2 plus cases. So these are all women that are above 30 years old. And we can see that Alinity correctly identified all 68 women with CN2 plus, uh, which corresponds to 100% of clinical sensitivity and corresponds to relative sensitivity of 1.05. It also meet the non-inferiority criteria of Meyer guidelines. And with this, we have confirmed the first requirement of HPV assays, so the clinical sensitivity. The clinical specificity was assessed on more than 3,000 women that were above 30 years old. And the clinical specificity of alinity was 92.4 and of hybrid capture 91.9, so a bit lower, and that corresponds to relative specificity of 1.05. It also meets the non-inferiority criteria, it, so the p-value is below 0 0.05. And with our cohort, we have also shown that alinity meets the requirement regarding the clinical specificity. So the last requirement is the performance of alinity according to intralaboratory and interlaboratory agreement. The intralaboratory agreement was performed on 550 samples. The third of these samples were HPV positive with hybrid capture 2 according to the guidelines. And the samples were tested approximately one year apart. And we have shown here that the overall percentage agreement is really high. It's 96.7, uh, which corresponds to kappa value of 0 0.92. And we have uh, shown this 
city values that were plotted. So we were interesting how the city value corresponds between uh, laboratory when testing samples one year apart. And we have done that for all the channels of alinity. And we can see that it corresponds really nice. There are not much of the outliners. The interlaboratory agreement was performed in two different laboratories and also one year apart. The overall agreement was even higher than interlaboratory. It was 98.7 with kappa value of 0.97. We have also plotted this uh, on graphs, and we can see that all channel corresponds in two different laboratories taken, taken one year apart. So with this, we have fulfilled the last requirement of HPV tests that can be used. And we have shown that the alinity meets the requirements and can be can be considered as clinically validated and used in clinical practice. We have also published this in JCM last year, so uh, more information can be found in, in the article. So the next part, I would like to present the comparison of alinity with COBAS 4800. So both of these assays are real-time PCR-based tests, and we have performed similar analysis that we did for, for the hybrid capture. The numbers are a bit uh, lower, and that is because, if you remember, the COBAs were um, used only for cohort from the first screening round. So we have assessed the clinical sensitivity in 44 CN2 plus cases, and you can see that both assays correctly identified all 44 assays as HPV positive, leading to a relative sensitivity of 1, and also p-value below 0 0.05, meeting the first requirement. The specificity was assessed on more than 3,000 women, it was 92.9 for COBAS and 92.4 for alinity. Um, so the relative specificity was 0 0.99, and it also met the non-inferiority criteria. So there was no significantly different um, specificity assessed in our study between COBAS and alinity. So furthermore, we have also compare alinity and COBAS in analytical, um, as, as uh, for analytical agreement. And we can see that overall agreement for high-risk HP positivity was 97.9, so really high. And also the type-specific agreement for HPV 16, 18, and other high-risk HPV are all extremely high, almost 900% for, for all of the channels that we have analyzed. So maybe I would just show here that um, this was performed in the way that the channel A, B, and 45 were considered identical as the channel other, uh, other high risk from COBAS. Mm, so one could argue here that the agreement is so high because of number of HPV negative results that we have. So as you can see here, more than 3,800 samples were, H were considered as HPV negative with both assays. So in the next analysis, we have discarded all the HPV negative, and we have conducted only the uh, analysis for positive agreement for high-risk HPV. But we can see that there is not a lot of difference, uh, differences that uh, we show. The agreement is still over 80%. It's um, almost 90% for HPV-16. 
it's slightly lower for HPV 18, uh, but the confidence intervals are quite wide due to a low number of HPV 18 infections alone. So with this, uh, I would conclude the first part of clinical evaluation according to Meyer guidelines. And I would like to go beyond the guidelines that are uh, that uh, are uh, needed to be met for for the clinical uh, use, and show you a bit um, uh, a bit about risk for CN2 plus and CN3 plus in our cohort. So um, I'm going to talk about two different risks. The first risk is baseline risk. So when I'm going to talk about baseline risk, we have considered only the CN2 plus lesions that were identified in the first screening round, so that means 68 CN2 plus cases. And when I'm going to talk about risk within three years, uh, all the CN2 plus cases that were identified in both screening rounds are included in this analysis. So I would like to start this section for risk stratification according to negative baseline characteristics. So we have taken all the women that were above 30 years old and who had normal cytology at baseline. And we can see that the risk for CIN2 plus within three years for these women is 0 0.65, which is relatively low. However, it's still 15 times higher when compared to HPV negative result. So women who are HPV negative at baseline have extremely low risk for development of CIN2 plus lesion. And this uh, risk is um, comparable between all the HPV assays that were used for our cohort. We have also done the sub-analysis for co-testing, and we can see that the co-testing in our cohort didn't add a lot of value compared to HPV testing alone. And the, the, when we take the risk certification according to um, positive baseline characteristics, so we have taken all women that were HPV positive, and um, you can see, as expected here, the highest risk have women who are HPV 16 positive or HPV 16 or 18 positive. So the green line is a linear result, the yellow one is real time, and the violet is COBUS. And you can see that the risk are, is very uh, comparable between these three tests. Uh, what I would like to draw your attention here is the difference for alinity A and B gen channel. So we can see that women have high, so that women that are positive for channel A have higher risk than those who are positive for channel B. And this is even statistically significant if we take um, into the consideration the longitudinal component of our study. So the baseline risk within three years for women that are positive for HPV types included in the channel A is very much higher than those who are positive only for HPV types that are included in channel B. We have done the same for risk for CIN3+, and the pictures are really similar, except uh, 95 confidence intervals are wider here. That is due to the lower number of CN3 plus cases identified in our study. However, the difference is still uh, very, can be very nicely seen. So it's the highest for HPV 16. That is also, of course, in accordance to many other studies that have shown that women who are HV16 and 18 positive have the higher risk for CIN3+. Maybe 
it can be more uh, clearly seen in, in the next few slides. So what we have done here, we have divided women according to the alinity results into five groups. So in the first group, high-risk HPV, we have all the women that are HPV positive, regardless of the HPV types. In non-avalent HPV group, we have included only HPV types that are also included in the non-avalent vaccine. The next group is HPV 16 or 18 positive, and then other A channel and other B channel of the alinity. And here the risk stratification is even more uh, nicely shown. So uh, what is concerning that one out of five women that have HPV 16 or HPV 18 infection also have an underlying CN2 plus. So this means that all the women that are HPV 16 or 18 positive do require immediate colposcopy. Uh, but what I wanted to show here as well is that one out of 11, 11 women of, that are positive for a Linity A channel have underlying CN2+, in comparison to one out of 40 um, women that are positive for other B channel of alinity alone. Also, if we consider the a CN2+, plus within three years, so the, it, the numbers are even worse for, for women. One out of three are going to develop CN2+, plus in the next three years, uh, in comparison to one out of five if they're only HPV positive. Uh, similar is for the CIN3+. So in our study, one out of nine women that were positive for HPV 16 or 18 had underlying CIN3 plus lesion. And um, if, again, we take into the consideration the difference between the channel A and channel B, we can see that this is four times lower between, between these two channels. And again, within three years, we can see that only one out of 35 women that is positive for other B channel alone will develop CIN3 plus within the next three years. So what we ha have constructed here, we have constructed the, um, theoretic, the theoretical pathway of women through HPV primary screening according to, to our results of our study. And as we can see here, the, most of the women are going to be HPV negative, and they're going to be returned to the next screening round. And the number of HPV negative women according to COBUS or Alinity result are, is basically the same. It's not statistically significant. Um, about a little more than 10% of women were considered as HPV positive. And again, this, this is uh, very similar for COBUS and Alinity. And this group uh, we have divided on three subgroups according to their uh, risk. And the, the first group is the group that have immediate risk of CIN3 plus above 5%. So for this stratification, we have used the threshold according to 2012 ASCCP clinical guidelines. And so women who have this risk above 5% require immediate colposcopy. So these women are those who were positive for HPV 16 and 18. And so the p-value between COBUS and alinity is above 0 0.05, so that means that there is no statistically significant difference between the number of women that would be referred to immediate colposcopy. So the second subgroup is those women who have immediate risk of CI entry plus between 2 and 5 percent, and we can see that number of women that have this uh, with uh, is 378 using COBUS, and 
more than half less when using alinity. So only women that were positive that were positive for HPV 45 or channel A are were uh, were put into this group, and the p-value is below 0 0.05. So that means that statistically significant less women would be referred to six to twelve month follow up compared uh, when compared uh, linearity with COBAS. So interestingly, we have found that women that uh, were positive for other B, and uh, please note that we are talking here for women that are above 30 years old, so their risk of CN3 plus is below 2%, two which means that they can be returned to screening round. And again, we can see that there is a difference between number of women that would be returned to screening. And with this, we could also lower the number of women that would have to return to, to 6 to 12 month follow-up visit. So with this, I would conclude the results from our cohort. And I'm going to present the last part of my talk, and that is the clinical performance of alinity in Valgent framework. So as you know, Valgent was initiated in 2012. Um, it's basically a framework that allows the comparison and validation of HPV assays with different genotyping capability. And so far, four Valgent frameworks were performed. And today, we're going to focus on Valgen 3 that was performed on Slovenian samples. And we have uh, included 14 different HPV assays in Valgen 3. Here is the list of HPV assays that were evaluated in Valgen 3. And we're going to focus today on performance of alinity. So, First, uh, just a few words on sample selection in Valgen framework. So according to the protocol, we have included 1,300 women uh, from screening program, and this was enriched with 300 women that were diagnosed with either ASCUS, LCL, or HICIL. So of these seven were excluded from the further analysis due to the invalid internal control. And a total of 100 and 593 samples were included in the final analysis. So clinical sensitivity was assessed on 126 CN2 plus cases, while the clinical specificity was assessed on 1,212 controls. As controls, we have only considered those women who had two consecutive negative cytology results, so we are so that we we make sure that women are uh, really can uh, are without disease. So, as as far as uh, the the performance of linity in comparison to hybrid capture. Uh, we have shown here in this table, so we have divided the analysis in two groups uh, for women older than 30 years old and then the total study population. So basically, regardless of the population, we can see that alinity showed higher sensitivity and specificity. Uh, compared to hybrid capture 2, it was 1.034 CN2 plus and CN3 plus, and the specificity was 1.05, 1, uh, 1.01. 1 .01. So it's higher when compared to hybrid capture. Also, the non-inferiority criteria was met for both specificity and sensitivity. And the similar results are for total study population. We have performed the same analysis using COBAS 4800 as standard comparator. 
and in Valgent, the sensitivity of alinity was higher than that of Cobus with 1.02 for CIN2+, and also for the CIN3+. We have also shown that the specificity is the same for Cobus and alinity in Valgent, and it's, it meets the non-inferiority criteria when compared to Cobus. So we have also checked the genotyping agreement between alinity and Cobus. So as I mentioned, both of these tests uh, enables the partial HPV-16 genotyping. And we can see that concordance assessed on almost 100 and 600 samples is very high for any HPV type detected. So it's 97.6, which corresponds to kappa value of 0 0.93. And it's almost 100% for HPV 16 with a kappa value of 0 0.97. So we were also interested, since both of these time, uh, both of these assays are real-time assays, what what happens to CT values. And we have plotted here the CT values for HPV-16 channel of COBUS and of alinity. And we, it, uh, so it's clear that it corresponds really nicely between these two assays. Uh, we have very few outliners. And so we have concluded that genotyping correlation is, is really good for, for HPV-16 channel. We have performed the same analysis for HPV-18, which is, again, really high, almost 100%, uh, with kappa 0.93. We have, again, plotted this in this graph, and we can see, again, that the CT values correspond between these two tests very, very nicely. And uh, a special sub-analysis was performed for HPV-16 and or 18 infection and was, again, uh, really high. So it, we have concluded that the performance of alinity uh, corresponds really nicely with the performance of Cubas in Valgent 3. So this brings me to my conclusions of these lectures. So we have shown that the clinical sensitivity and specificity of alinity were non-inferior to those of hybrid capture. We have also shown that the clinical sensitivity and specificity of alinity were non-inferior to those of COBAS in our study. Our interlaboratory and interlaboratory reproducibility showed high overall percent, uh, percent agreement which suggests that alinity has very robust and reliable performance. And with that said, we have concluded that alinity fulfills the international consensus guideline requirements and can be considered clinically validated for HPV primary cervical cancer screening. Uh, next, we have shown that in Slovenian HPV prevalence study, the overall and type-specific high-risk HPV genotyping agreement between the alinity and COBUS was excellent for all the common HPV types, so all the kappa values were above 0 0.8. Uh, we have also shown in the risk stratification that women that are older than 30 years and who are HPV uh, alinity negative had lower risk for CN2 plus within the next three years than those who have normal baseline cytology, and that this risk is comparable to that determined by real-time hybrid capture or COBUS. We have also shown that HV16 infection was associated with significantly higher baseline and also uh, within three year risk for CN2 plus and CN3 plus, and that women who are HV16 and 18, uh, they require immediate colposcopy. Uh, but we have also found out, 
found out that women who are positive for channel A and channel B uh, exhibited remarkably different risks for CN2+, and CN3+, uh, which led to the statistically significant difference in number of women that would need to return to 6 to 12 months follow-up visit if extended alienity genotyping uh, would be used as a triage in HPV primary screening. So I would like to thank all the people that participated in our study. Uh, it, the study wouldn't be possible without them, and I would really like to thank them. Um, yes, and with this, I will conclude my lecture, and um, we'll happy to answer any of your questions if you have. Thank you, Anya, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Your first question is, can you explain the difference between HPV-16 and HPV-18? Uh, sure. So uh, these are the two most common uh, HPV genotypes. Uh, so together they cause about 70% of cervical cancer. Uh, HPV-16 uh, and is associated with the highest risk for development of precancerous lesions and cancer. And uh, when the so uh, when the genotyping started as possible triage methods. Uh, these two genotypes were between um, most wanted target targets uh, in in the screening. Great, thank you. Now, hybrid capture is an older method to compare against. What other methods should be used for comparison that meets the international guidelines? Uh, well, according to guidelines that are currently accepted, only two standard comparators are uh, available. One is the hybrid capture 2, and the other one is GP5 plus 6 plus. Um, but um, uh, we are hoping that we will, we will soon get some new comparators. Um, and uh, between those that are um, associated or those that are currently on the market, uh, probably all assays that fulfills clinical um, so clinical uh, guidelines for for uh, use in primary surgical screening could be um, in could be considered as as a standard comparator. Um, most probably uh, COBAS, Roche uh, will be, uh, is one of the uh, most, uh, so most likely, uh, but there are also several others. Um, so uh, the Abbott real-time uh, test uh, or BD or um, so all of the tests that are currently very uh, widely used in, in the screening. Thank you. Now, can you tell us which age group has the highest HPV cancer? Um, yeah, well, mostly in, uh, um, so in women that are between 45 and more, uh, but it, it differs between the countries and, uh, and mostly it depends on the screening that is available in, in the country. So in the countries that do, do not have organized cervical screening or where the, the, so the coverage of the screening is very low or not accessible to women, this is also uh, in, in younger age groups, so in the 
less developed countries and the countries in, in, in the, with low income. Uh, this also hits women between 30 and 45, which is um, the worst age group for, for uh, that, I mean, these are the age groups that are uh, very, uh, that could be prevented with, with screening. Uh, so, um, I would say that in in the more more developed countries, uh, so a, older ages like uh, above 45, uh, or also um, in the non-responders. So these are the, the group of women that uh, do not respond to um, uh, gynecologist invitations, and in the low-income and middle-income countries. Uh, this shift to um, younger age groups, so um, above 30. Thank you. Which method do you prefer for HPV detection? <laughs> well, um, personally, <laughs> I, I have no preference. I, I think that the HPV method uh, that is used in um in screening should be uh very uh so automated uh so the hands on time should be uh very um should be set to minimum uh but it also should be very um reliable and uh would have to show very good clinical performance in in the comparison um so i i don't have a preference about the specific HPV method, but uh, all the tests that show ha has shown good clinical performance and are um, th that enables automated and fast HPV detections are are my favorite. Great, thank you. All right, your next question is extended genotyping seems to show clinical relevance for risk. How are you using this information in your clinical practice? Uh, well, I see in, in Slovenia, uh, we have, um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, at the moment using conventional cytology as uh, primary screening. So HPV is used uh, already as a triage, but uh, we are hoping and um, also globally, um, it has um, it has uh, been uh, so determined that HPV genotyping, especially uh, extended uh, genotyping, that means above HPV 16 and 18, um, is is a, a possible uh, way to go for the triage. Um, so the idea is that we would uh, we would have HPV primary screening um, and then use uh, the same sample. So that would uh, that would be very good for also for the women who are participating in screening because only one uh, visit would be uh, necessary to to the gynecologist instead of uh, two. Uh, so in in cases in in cases where women are HPV positive, the um, information about HPV genotype would be uh, implemented in the in the flowchart. So those with the highest risk. So as we have shown in in this lecture, so women with HPV 16, 18, and possibly 45 and other AS we have shown here, those uh, those women would be um, invited to immediate colposcopy, or um, those with other A uh, in a six month visit, while those who would be positive uh, for channel B uh, could be actually returned to the to the screening and um, they would be checked again in in three years. Um, without losing any any um, cancer detection in in the program, I hope that answers the questions. Thank you so much. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. It says, in your opinion or experience, 
what is needed to ensure that HPV primary screening is implemented correct, and what has been done in Slovenia? Uh, well, I, I would say that the first thing that is needed in the organized screening is the coverage. So the coverage for, in order that screening is effective, uh, we, we need to achieve the coverage above 70% uh, at least to, to um, dramatically reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. Um, in Slovenia, as I mentioned, we have uh, very high coverage rates in national uh, screening program, and we are very happy about it. Um, the plan is um, we are uh, conducting a pilot study at the moment in Slovenia, and um, so the first uh, step uh, that we will try to achieve is the implementation of liquid-based cytology. And then uh, this is um, we are still uh, deciding how to proceed. Uh, either we are gonna um, go with the primary cytology uh, for women that are younger, and then above 35 HPV testing. Um, and we still haven't. Um, we are still. Um, testing and uh, trying to decide what would be the best uh, triage method for, for our country. Thank you again, Anya. Do you have any final comments for our audience before we go today? Um, well, um, I would just like to thank them for, for their intention and if you uh, if they have any uh, additional questions, or um, I am available at my email, um, anya.osterbrink, um, and they can send the questions. Thank you so much. And it looks like we had one more question come in, snuck right in here. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and try and answer this one before we go today. It says, why sure. is HPV... <laughs> Thank you. It says, why is HPV 16 and 18 um, riskier in comparison with HPV 31, 56, 59, etc.? Well, all the HPV genotypes that we know, and, and at the moment we have more than 200 and uh, HPV uh, genotypes that are um, uh, so that are recognized, uh, and, but uh, the, we are still uh, not sure about why some of the risk, some of the HPV genotypes are associated with the higher risk for development of CIN2+. Plus. Um, but hmm. Probably, I, probably there is uh, s uh, some sort of uh, different, um, like um, the the virus has different. Uh, how to put that? <laughs> so uh, it um, when it's integrated in the in the genome, um, it looks like the HPV types that are that are associated with the higher risk. Are are more um, aggressive and in the uh, they are causing the the underlying lesions um, most uh, so um, more times than than the other uh, HPV uh, genotypes. But uh, there are some uh, studies available that are trying to. Um, to, to see the underlying mechanisms for the uh, tropism and and uh, and the risk that is associated with the infection. Thank you for that, and thank you, Anya, for your time today and for your research. We would also like to sure. thank Labyrinth. Thank you, and our sponsor, Abbott Global Scientific Affairs, for underwriting today's educational webcast. 
And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by Anya via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labyrinth will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.